So far, we're at a place where we know every knot is one colorable. Every knot, let's say every knot that has k, uh, and I might just say d, every knot of d crossings is for sure one colorable. Just color everything the same color. And we also know every knot of d crossings is going to be decolorable. Just give every arc its own separate color. Um, and the question is, what about the in-between? Is it possible for a knot to be k colorable, where k is in between 1 and d? Let's start, um, let's start simple. So we know every knot is one colorable. What if we try to bump that one up to two? So what I'd like to do is give you the opportunity to color. Two colorability is bunk, because at any given crossing in a knot, we're always going to have three strands be incident, like this, right? And so if I only have two colors to work with, and maybe this one ends up being one color, and I try to make this other one, this other strand over here, a different color. Then the question is, what color do I have to make this third strand? It can't be the same. It can't be right. different. So we're stuck. right? And the only way to two-color a knot is just to color everything the same color, which is not really a two-coloration at all. Right? So two-colorability is not an interesting question. Every two-coloration of a knot is really just a one-coloration. So we're not using the second color. Right? So two-colorability is not interesting at all. So of course, the smallest number of colors in which this is an interesting question is three. So three is where we're going to pick up the story. Is every knot three colorable? Is it possible that there is a knot out there where, that we can't use three colors to color? Like a four crossing knot, for example. Well, we know that every four crossing knot is four colorable, and it's also one colorable, but eh, is it going to be, is it, is it be possible for a four crossing knot to be three colorable? That's great. Interesting that you would point that out. So just by sort of sketching things out, um, we quickly found that 6-1 <coughs> has a three coloration, right? which you found just by picking an arc and coloring it, uh, and then sort of following around the diagram and saying, what choices can I make at each of the crossings? Right? Start with this red arc here, maybe, and then over here, well, if I want this to be a three coloration, maybe I should make the next arc a different color and the overcrossing a different color still. So in start my three coloration right here. Um, then we follow this blue crossing over here and make some choices over there and so forth. And we find out that this knot actually does match up with three colors, whereas 6-2 didn't. We tried it with three colors. We couldn't find a three coloration. We tried again with four colors. We couldn't find a four coloration. We had to go all the way up to five, in which case we actually did find a five coloration. Um, and the observation there was that in order for that five coloration to have existed, there have to be two arcs in this diagram that don't meet at a crossing. Right? And the two green arcs here are the ones that seem to meet that criterion. So we could have a five coloration where two arcs are green and the remaining four arcs are each different colors. Um, so it seems like there's a lot going on as far as colorability. It seems like it's really rich in terms of telling us the topological information of a knot, right? How, not just how the crossings are arranged, but how the arcs of this diagram connect up one with another. Um, so it's going to be our goal to take colorability and try to turn it into an algebraic structure, right? to figure out how we can represent colorability in some reasonable way. Um, but before we go to the algebra side, um, what I want to do is take, maybe we'll take these examples, 6-1 and 6-2, so if we have those transparencies handy. Um, and I want to turn this from a colorability question about knots back into a colorability question about rational tangles, because each of these is a rational knot, uh, and therefore there is a rational tangle, and we have nice complete invariants for rational tangles that we can use. Um, on the back side of your page is the rational tangle associated with the knot, the rational knot that's on the front side. Um, so the next phase of what I'd like to try um, is to color these tangles, except that coloring the tangles is going to be something a little different. So well, tangles are clearly different from knots, right? And that they, there's a little bit more freedom because the strands at the top corners, at the corners of the tangle, don't connect one with another. Uh, and so that kind of eliminates some of the arcs. Uh, 
uh, that would otherwise be a part of this diagram. Um, and so how, how I'd like for us to systematically think about how these tangles get colored is to think of them a little bit differently. Rather than, um, rather than thinking of labeling these with colors, let's think about labeling them with numbers for a second. Um, and just for the sake of being systematic, we're going to start in this upper left-hand corner here of each tangle um, by giving these arcs the, the colors 0 and 1. So sort of thinking of this as being green and this piece here as being red. Right? Um, so for following the pattern for three color ability, what color would this strand here have to have? Blue. A different color, right. So we'll put a blue on this strand, and therefore I'm going to color this all the way over here. That'll get colored blue. Then when this red one comes back around, green. right, we can switch that over to green. And then when this blue one comes back around, this can be red again. Right? Uh, and then when the blue, when the green crosses under the red, it's going to have to become blue. So give this a shot. So try to color in your tangles um, for each of these and see if there is a relationship between the, the tricolorability of the tangle that you have and the colorability that we just found of the knot on the previous slide. So when we go through this process for both of these tangles, we find out that both of them actually admit a three coloration, um, which is kind of surprising, right? Because the knots were different as far as the tricolorability was concerned, but the tangles were both three colorable. Um, and how do these tangles turn back into knots? They get turned into knots with a numerator closure, right? By connecting up the top strands and the bottom strands over here. And you can imagine that if we did that, then these two arcs at the bottom would have to have the same color as one another. And so right now they have different colors, and so it would seem like that could lead to potential problems, right? If we just try to connect these up. Um, whereas if we form the denominator closure of this one, right, connect up the sides, we already have these two green strands. And that would clearly give a three color ability of the denominator closure of the tangle on the left. Whereas on the right, no matter which way we try to close up this tangle, whether it's the numerator closure or the denominator closure, we're necessarily closing up different colored strands. Mm -hmm. right? um, so there's something that feels a little different there. Um, so what we want to do next is to try and begin the process of turning this into an algebraic structure. And I'd started by labeling the two colors over here, 0 and 1. So 0 for red, 1 for green. Uh, if we use that same scheme over here, then the next thing I'd like for you to do is to draw in those numbers. So 0, 1, and 2, I suppose, would be the third color uh, in each one of these. Um, and see if you can come up with a relationship. So what? What equation, I'll say it this way, what equation will hold the same at each crossing in a tricoloration? Where at that crossing, we have the colors, let's call them uh, x, y, and z. So what I'm looking for, I guess, is an equation which is true whenever x, y, and z are all different, and which is also true whenever x, y, and z are all equal. So one equation that can be true in both of those cases and exactly only both of those cases. So what we're really asking is we want for this equation that we're coming up with <laughs> to be true in the following cases. Could it be an equality? <laughs> <laughs> equation true for x equals y equals z equals 0, x equals y equals z equals 1, x equals y equals z equals 2. Right, so those are the cases where all the colors that are incident at that crossing are the same. And we need the equation to be true when x is 1, sorry, x is 0, y is 1, z is 2, and any permutation of that. Right, x is 0, y is 2, z is 1, right? In any permutation. And we need the equation to be false in every other case. 
we need the equation to be false as soon as two of these are the same and the other one is different. But you're very much getting warm. So one of the advantages that x plus y plus z has is that it has the symmetry with respect to any permutation of x, y, and z. That quantity, x plus y plus z, is going to be the same however we rearrange x, y, and z. Uh, and so if we can get it to work, if we get an equation that works for one of these permutations, it'll work for all these permutations. If x plus y plus z is the quantity, right? And having it be 3 ensures that 0, 1, and 2 are going to work, and that 1, 1, and 1 are going to work. Um, what are the other possibilities for x plus y plus z to be? in this formulation that will make zero, three, and six. Zero, three, and six. Um, so what we need is we need a kind of arithmetic that does not see the difference between the number zero, the number three, and the number six. Oh, when I say oh. fanciful, that's what I'm talking about. We want an arithmetic that doesn't, that doesn't think of zero, three, and six as being different. Like mod three arithmetic? Like mod three arithmetic. If we declare that 0, 3, and 6 are all the same thing yes. by computing mod 3, then what is the, what is the residue mod 3 that they're all equal to? What kind of mod 3? They'd all equal 0. They would all equal 0 mod 3. So light, right, we'll loop back to, to remind ourselves of what modular yeah, arithmetic yeah, no, is yeah. in just a second, because this is, this, is, this is the key, this right, is the key point here. Right. So this is the equation that we want, right? that each of these crossings this equation will be true exactly when all three are the same. Because if all three are the same, then they're going to add up to three times something, right? and therefore be 0 mod 3. Or if they're all different, then they're going to be 0, 1, and 2, which add up to exactly 3, which is congruent to 0 mod 3. So this is the equation we want. Let's take a moment to, to unpack what that means. How does modular arithmetic work? Um, the way modular arithmetic works is that the, the elements that you do arithmetic with, instead of being numbers, what we're really doing is we're really doing arithmetic with remainders. So modular arithmetic is arithmetic with remainders. And they're remainders after you've divided by a fixed number. So remainders after dividing by a number. Let's call it, let's, let's use 3 for the moment, after dividing by 3. So for example, um, if I have an arithmetic problem like 17 plus 12 is equal to 29 that's working at the level of integers. Um, then if I divide each one of those things by 3 and just take the remainder, so 17 divided by 3 is going to be, what, 5 with a remainder of 2. 12 divided by 3 is 4 with a remainder of 0. 29 divided by 3 is 9 with a remainder of 2. If I just take the remainders of those, then I get a new equation. And that new equation is still true. 2 plus 0 is equal to 2. Right? So modular arithmetic is arithmetic done just with the remainders after you divide by a fixed number. Um, and so what we would write, the way that we write this in notation, is we write that a, a number is congruent to another number. We use this. Um, uh, triple equals is an equivalent sign, mod p here, um, means, um, and the definition is that the difference of the two numbers here, n minus m, is congruent to 0 mod p. That's just by subtracting m from both sides. But that means, so it's easiest to say what congruent to 0 means. Congruent to 0 mod p means is a multiple of p, right? Because when you divide it by p, the remainder is 0. Modular arithmetic is sometimes called clock arithmetic, because it's the kind of arithmetic you do on the, the face of a clock, mod 12, right? Um, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11. So if I want to know, for example, if it's 6 o'clock right now and I go 13 hours from now, well, at the level of integers, I get 19. But what is 19 the same as mod 12? 7, seven mod 12. Oh, I remember. So 13 hours after 6 o'clock is going to be 7 o'clock. Now it's going to be a 7 p.m., so you know, 
if, if we don't care about AM or PM, we get 12, mod 12 clock arithmetic. If we care, we might get mod 24 clock arithmetic or military time. Right? Um, and so modular arithmetic has a lot, you know, you can do a lot of stuff with it because you can study, you can use modular arithmetic to study a lot about the properties of numbers, properties of integers, right? Um, so when we say, as we said a, a screen ago, that the equation that we want to be satisfied at every crossing is x plus y plus z is equal to 0 mod 3, that just means that x plus y plus z equals 0 needs to be always a multiple of 3. Right? And so 0 works, 3 works, and 6 works as the sum for x plus y plus z. If they're all zeros, it'd be 0. If we add up all 1s, it'd be 3. If we add up all 2s, it'd, it'd be 6. And if we add a 0, a 1, and a 2, we get 3, right. which is oh. still congruent to 0. Right. So this is kind of the magic equation um, that is going to hold at each one of the crossings in a three coloration of a knot diagram. Um, so this just connects to tri, tri colorability because for tri colorability, each arc, each color that we assign to an arc, is going to be taken from the set of residues mod three, zero, one, and two, um, and. I think you, it's not too difficult to convince yourself that we would get the same relationship if instead of 0, 1, 2, we had chosen something else which has the same residues mod 3. Like let's say we used 6, negative 2, and I don't know, 11 or something as my three labels, right? Um, since these are equivalent mod 3, these are equivalent mod 3, these are equivalent mod 3, then any equation that these satisfy will also be satisfied by these mod 3. So if we wanted to, we could use these as the labels, and the arithmetic would still work the same. So why don't we just use the simplest possible representatives uh, for the equivalence classes, uh, the residue classes, mod 3, 0, 1, and 2. Um, and the nice thing about this is that then we can generalize this later on. If we want to know more about four colorations, then we'll just use 0, 1, 2, and 3, and we'll do the arithmetic mod 4. The problem is that this nice relationship, which is true exactly if and only if the colors are the same or different, um, we lose that when we go to four colorations, five colorations, and so forth, because there's more freedom to work with. Um, so part of our job is going to be trying to claw that back a little bit, if we can. Um, but tricolorability is awesome because of this, right? because this one equation completely determines whether or not we have a tricoloration. If this equation is true at every crossing, then we have a tricoloration. If this equation is violated at even one crossing, then we lose.